All right, in this last video of our look at general chemistry one here at Vincennes University, we are going to focus on chapter 21 in the textbook, which is all about nuclear chemistry. And so <clears throat> from this end, um, we need to define clearly what nuclear chemistry is all about. And so for this, we need to go back to a concept that we talked about in chapter two with regard to radioactivity. Radioactivity is at the very heart of what we would call nuclear chemistry. Nuclear chemistry being just the study of reactions that involve changes in nuclei. And radioactivity is largely credited to Henri Becquerel, um, who discovered radioactivity in a mineral called pitchblende, um, which was a mixture of radium and some other things. And others have known to use radioactivity. In particular, we know of Rutherford, who used alpha particles to help to design his experiments on atomic structure. And we know of the Curies, who, through their work with Becquerel, helped to discover the elements polonium and radium. But when it comes to radioactivity in this whole field of nuclear chemistry, we have to get to the very heart of it. And the very heart of radioactivity has everything to do with something called nuclear stability. Nuclear stability basically comes from the idea that with any atom, with any um, substance, any element past hydrogen, anything that has more than one proton, we're going to have opposing forces occurring in the nucleus. In particular, we're going to have more than one proton in there. And the abundance of protons, we know that protons are positively charged, and those positive charges are going to repel each other. Um, and so the more protons we have to pack into that small space, the more repulsion there's going to be overall. And this brings us to the role of the neutron. The neutron's really there in that nucleus as a stabilizing force. Um, because by packing neutrons into that nucleus, we can separate those positive charges from each other and therefore they will have less of an impact on each other overall. So overall, neutrons have a really important role in maintaining nuclear stability. And the overall ratio of protons and neutrons to each other is gonna be an important factor in just how stable that nucleus ends up being. And so this brings us overall to a concept known as the belt of stability. Now, the belt of stability is a graph. It is a graph that plots all of the known nuclei for all um, different types of elements. And it plots, in particular, the stable nuclei and gives you an idea of what the stable nuclei look like versus non-stable nuclei. And what we notice is that from that proton to neutron ratio perspective, we see a one-to-one -one ratio of protons to neutrons for our so-called light elements. And these light elements would be any element really with an atomic number um, less than or equal to 20. So <clears throat> once you get to calcium, we see that the proton to neutron ratio does start to bend more toward the neutrons there. So, and you can see this on the periodic table as well. Look at the molar masses of each of the elements. What we will find is that we have a one-to-one -one or really close to one-to-one -one ratio among those most stable nuclei that make up the majority of the abundance of those elements. Hydrogen, one proton, no neutrons. Helium, two protons, two neutrons. Lithium, three protons, four neutrons. And you can look on that periodic table and you'll see the same kind of pattern evolving throughout. As we get to heavier elements, such as um, you know, pretty much any of them, um, we see that the ratio starts to bend more toward one and a half to one by the time we get to our really heavy elements. Um, and this would get up, up toward you know, things like bismuth, lead, um, 
uh, up on the upper scale of our most stable, our last stable nuclei for that matter. Those that exist outside the belt are said to either be neutron rich, meaning they have too many neutrons and are therefore unstable because of the abundance of neutrons, or they are neutron poor, meaning that they lack neutrons and there are too many protons, there's too much repulsion, and that's what's leading to its lack of stability. And so this is a graph of the band of stability. In this band of stability, you can see the black dots represent all of the known stable nuclei that exist. The yellow dots represent other known nuclei but are also known to be unstable. And so what we can see is that this red line represents a one-to-one -one ratio of protons and neutrons. And we can see that for the most part, up until we get to element number 20 here, the majority of the dots are right on this line, either a little bit above it or a little bit below it. But once we get to calcium here, element number 20, we do see that it starts to bend up. And by the time we hit the iron, it's about 1.15 to 1. By the time we hit iodine, number 53, it's about 1.4 to 1. And finally, when we hit bismuth, it's about 1.5 to 1. And also notice, bismuth, element number 83, bismuth 209. This is the last known stable isotope. There are no stable isotopes that exist beyond bismuth 209. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't isotopes. We can see there are plenty of isotopes above and below bismuth 209 on this band of stability. But this is the last one that is known to be stable. Now, we can also see from this graph, we have areas that are neutron rich. So the area above include neutron rich nuclides. These guys right here, we can see that below the band of stability, we have neutron poor nuclides. And then the ones that are up here, the ones above 83, are just generally called heavy nuclei. Now, where we fall in relation to the band of stability will often impact what kind of radioactive decay we will undergo. Heavy nuclei tend to form a, they tend to uh, undergo alpha emission most often. That's not an always kind of thing. That's a usually kind of thing. If they are neutron rich, so if they're in the yellow region above the band of stability, they tend to undergo a decay called beta decay. And if they are below the band of stability, they undergo a different kind of beta decay called positron emission, or they undergo a rare form of decay called electron capture, where the nucleus actually goes out and grabs one of those core electrons and turns that proton into a neutron. So this is what we're going to be talking about for the majority of this, of this lesson. Um, I'm going to throw this out to you. Um, since all of you are watching this on YouTube, uh, I would invite you to pause the video at this point and come up with some answers, write them down on a piece of paper and just kind of brainstorm. Think of a couple of ideas to answer these questions as, as you go. So here are the questions. What holds a nucleus together? And moreover, since all the protons are positively charged and really close to each other, why doesn't the nucleus fall apart? Why don't those repulsive forces between the protons just cause the nucleus to disintegrate? So pause this video, take a second and, and answer this. I'm going to come back in three seconds and give you the answer. So what holds the nucleus together? Well, the answer to both of these questions 
come from something called strong nuclear force. Strong nuclear force is one of those fundamental forces of nature. And for those of you that are in physics, you know all about some of these fundamental forces. Now, this is one of those fundamental forces in particular that keeps the quarks together. So quarks being the sub subatomic particles that ultimately make up protons and neutrons and electrons. These sub subatomic particles are held together by a force called strong nuclear force and is ultimately what binds together the protons and neutrons to make up a nucleus. Now, where does this strong nuclear force come from? It comes from something else called a nuclear binding energy. So a nuclear binding energy <clears throat> is related to some concept that you are probably familiar with. You just didn't know that you were familiar with it yet. If you've ever heard of the equation E equals MC squared, then you have dealt, at least in some part, with what is ultimately holding together nuclei. Because binding energy, the energy that holds the nucleons together in a nucleus, is calculated by taking the change in mass, the mass defect of, an, of a particle, and multiplying it by the speed of light squared. So Einstein's famous equation, E is equal to mc squared. Well, this is kind of a modification of that. Binding energy, B, is equal to delta m c squared. Again, delta m being the mass defect, and c squared being the speed of light squared. Now, where does this mass defect come from? Well, if, you, if you've ever stopped to think about it, and you may have already kind of pictured this already, but if you look at the mass of a proton and the mass of the neutron, and you add those together, what you'll find is that the mass of a proton, the mass of a neutron, if I took those masses and add them together to make up a nucleus, um, you know, take something simple, take something like uh, helium-4, two protons, two neutrons. I should be able to calculate that really, really easily. Well, what I'll find is that the difference between the actual mass of helium-4 and the sum of the masses of two protons and two neutrons are different from each other. In fact, the mass of the two protons and the two neutrons individually is greater than the mass of the, the helium nucleus altogether. Now, why is that? Well, that's, that's the point here. Somewhere along the line, those four particles, when individual, come together. And when they come together, they lose some of their mass. And some of that mass gets converted into energy. That energy is the nuclear binding energy that holds together those four particles that were once separate, now in one nucleus. So here's our example. Helium-4, two protons, two neutrons. The mass of a proton is 1.673 times 10 to the negative seventh kilograms. The mass of a neutron is 1.675 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. So if I take those two numbers together, two times 1.673 times 10 to the 20, negative 27th, I would get 3.346 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms for the protons. And if I do the same thing for the neutrons, I would get 3.350 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. So if I add all of those together, I get 6.696 6 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. 
So that's the mass of the four particles, the four subatomic particles individually. Now, one atom of helium weighs 4.002. Let me double check that. Oh, excuse me. Check that 4.003. 4.003 AMUs, which if I convert that to kilograms, remember one AMU is equal to um, one over Avogadro's number of grams. So 4.003 divided by Avogadro's number. would be 6.647 times 10 to the negative 24th grams, which would be 6.647 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. So notice there is a difference between those two numbers. It's not very much, but it is enough. The mass defect here, 6.696 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms minus 6.647 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms would be 4.9 times 10 to the negative 29th kilograms, which means that its binding energy would be 4.9 times 10 to the negative 29th kilograms times three times 10 to the eighth meters per second squared which would give us a binding energy of 4.4 .4 times 10 to the negative 12 um, joules. So you may look at that and say, okay, well, that's not a whole lot of energy. Well, remember, that's only for one atom. You start getting a large sample, you start getting a mole of this stuff. And on a per mole basis, you're now talking about something along the lines of a little bit less than a billion, oh, excuse me, a little bit less than a trillion um, joules of energy for a mole of helium coming together. And so we can see why this kind of reaction would be so valued um, from, from an energetic standpoint at the very, very least. So that's what holds those, those nuclei together. And so obviously if that's what holds it together, when we break it apart or when it breaks apart, for whatever reason, there's gonna be considerable energy that is going to be lost along the way. And that is what we describe in the process of radioactive decay. Radioactive decay involves that spontaneous disintegration of nuclei that comes with two things, a release of energy um, usually ionizing energy, energy that is capable of ripping electrons away from whatever it interacts with, and particles. And these particles are usually dangerous in their own kind of way as well. What kind of radioactive decay we get depends upon the mode, whether we have a neutron rich or a neutron poor or a heavy atom. And there are four types of decay. There's the alpha decay, there's the beta decay, there's positron emission, and there's electron capture. We can track any of these using something called a transmutation reaction. A transmutation reaction involves the parent nucleus, the thing that is radioactive and decaying, and what it turns into after it decays. We call that the daughter nucleus. 
And so we go from a high energy, unstable state with the parent nucleus to a lower energy, more stable state with the daughter nucleus. Now that's not to say that the daughter nucleus isn't going to be radioactive itself. It could be, but we will know that it is going to be less radioactive, less dangerous, more stable than where it came from. These are equations that we do need to balance, but we balance them a little bit differently. Instead of worrying about numbers of atoms on each side, what we are going to focus on are mass numbers and atomic numbers. So I can almost divide an equation into four pieces. The vertical line represents the division between reactants on one side and products on the other side. And the horizontal line represents the division between the mass number on the top and the atomic number on the bottom. So on each side of the equation, I need to have the mass numbers even, and I need to have the atomic numbers even. Now the four modes of decay, alpha decay, this is where we have usually a heavy nucleus that will emit an alpha particle. Alpha particles are by contrast heavy, but yet not terribly, um, not terribly energetic because of their size. Think about what we've talked about in terms of momentum with gas molecules. Well, same kind of concept applies here. The heavier an object is, the slower it's going to be able to move, the less momentum it's going to carry, the less energy it's going to carry. Um, and so we tend to see this with heavier nuclei. Um, an example of this, um, uranium-238 is an unstable nucleus. When it ejects an alpha particle, alpha particle shown here um, as 4, 2, that is a mass number of 4, an atomic number of 2. Alpha particle is its name. Now, you could look at this. And in a very similar kind of way, think of this from the perspective of atomic number and mass number. And you would look at that and say, okay, wait, atomic number of two, that's an element. In fact, it's helium. And you'd be correct in saying so. An alpha particle is a helium nucleus. So if I take the electrons off of helium, and it's just the protons and the neutrons, I would have an alpha particle. But from a balancing perspective, look, look at our, our quadrants here. I started with a mass number of 238 with the uranium. The alpha particle gave me four. The other 234 is attached to the daughter nucleus. So the daughter nucleus has a mass number of 234. If I look at the atomic number 92, the alpha particle has two of those protons. The other 90 must be in the daughter nucleus. I can look at the periodic table. Element number 90 is thorium, TH. So that's alpha decay. And again, alpha decay, probably the most common for our things that we traditionally think of as radioactive, like your uraniums, like your neptuniums, like all of those uh, transuranium elements, all the synthetic ones that undergo alpha decay are usually. Um, and, and this is the case for most things that are heavier, that is, that are after bismuth on the periodic table. Beta decay. Um, in this process, we have a neutron-rich nucleus that gives up a, a um, negatron. A negatron um, sometimes referred to as an electron. It's very similar, only sub... Um, So that is an alternative way of showing a beta particle. 
Notice that my mass number and my atomic number are the same. Instead of the Greek letter beta, we can put in the electron E minus sign and be correct in doing so. But essentially what is happening here is we have something that is neutron rich. So we are turning a neutron into a proton through beta decay. And in the process, we are transitioning our element from, in this case, carbon to nitrogen. So in beta decay and in other types of decays, we are gonna see transmutation taking places. So we're gonna see elements turning from one nucleus to another as this decay occurs. And so that's beta decay. Now, before we move on to the other types of decay, understand that just because we've undergone some kind of radioactive decay, that doesn't mean that the process is over. Oftentimes, one radioactive nucleus will spawn another radioactive nucleus as its daughter nuclide. Um, especially when we're talking about the really, really heavy ones, even after they go undergo several alpha decays, they still are too heavy. They're still outside of the band of stability. And as a result, they're gonna undergo a series of decays to try to get it toward a more stable state. So one decay is often not enough to go from an unstable nucleus to a stable one. They often do go through these series. Now this, this one in particular um, is the decay series from uranium-238 all the way down to lead 206, which is a stable form of lead. But you can see in the process, we undergo several different alpha and then beta decays. So this process in total can take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We can take 15, 16 steps to do it. And each one of those can take a considerable amount of time to undergo. So decay series and, and radioactive decay to go from something that is unstable to something that is stable, this can take a really long time to do. Now onto the other two types of decay, positron emission. Positron emission is very, very similar to beta decay, um, only the opposite sign. So the opposite process is taking place. Here we have something that is neutron poor or uh, proton rich. What we're seeing in this process essentially is a proton is turning into a neutron. So one of these protons gives up its positive charge And I guess on the drawing, it's actually this one. One of its protons is giving up a positive charge and becoming a neutron. And in the process, our carbon 11, which is unstable, becomes boron 11, which is considerably more stable. And the positron emission, well, that's going to come with a bundle of energy along the way that's going to um, cause some damage when it encounters other objects. Electron capture is very, very similar, has the same effect on the nucleus as positron emission, but in a completely different manner. So we're getting the same kind of thing happening. A proton is turning into a neutron. But instead of having an emission causing that, we're going to have an electron basically be sucked up by the nucleus to turn that neutron, or excuse me, to turn that proton into a neutron. Now, how that happens, um, we're talking about an inner shell electron. So if you can think about those, those electron orbitals and rings, you know, we're taking something out of the first energy level and sucking it into the nucleus 
to stabilize that nucleus. And so as the nucleus gets stabilized through this electron capture, it releases tons of energy as it goes. But the end result, I had carbon 11, I now have boron 11. The result is essentially the same. The only difference is there's no particle on this side. That's really the only difference. Net result on the nucleus is the same, but it doesn't come with a particulate um, counterpart. Now there is another type of radioactive decay that has not been mentioned yet. It's called gamma radiation. Now gamma radiation is the only kind of radiation that does not come with a change in the nucleus, does not come with a change in the element itself. Um, what we usually see in gamma decay is we've got an unstable nucleus and it undergoes gamma decay. It releases a whole bunch of energy and the unstable nucleus becomes stable again, or at least more stable. Since it is pure energy and no particle power whatsoever, this is the most dangerous type of radioactive decay. Um, it has no mass, it's pure energy. We see this primarily as the result of what are called annihilation reactions, um, where um, two antimatter particles collide with each other, um, or we've got a, a positron and a negatron come together and the charges essentially cancel each other out. We just get a bundle of energy that comes off as a result of it. Um, and so that's gamma. If we investigate each of these in turn, we can see that each of them do have some um, penetrating power and ability. Um, alpha particles are capable of being blocked by your skin. Um, beta particles require small amounts of protection um, in the form of aluminum, paper, um, other kinds of media. Um, gamma rays are by far the most powerful, the most penetrating, and they have the most damage potential. The really, the only way that you can block gamma rays is through several inches um, nearing feet of concrete or you know, really, really, really dense materials like, like lead. Um, now, all three of these are ionizing radiation forms, meaning that as they interact with you, they will strip electrons from you. Um, and that's where some of their damage potential lies is once they've interacted, once they've been absorbed by your skin um, or by your internal organs, they can start to disrupt the very fabric of your cells. And that's where some of those things that are associated with radiation, things like cancers, um, carcinomas, um, other kinds of skin conditions, um, other kinds of uh, um, other health effects can, can really become a, a, a serious matter. But as you can see in the diagram here, your skin does a pretty good job of, blo of blocking alpha particles. Um, beta particles are able to penetrate your skin, so they do have some damaging effects there, but they can't get through to your tissues. They can't get through your bones. They can't get through to your internal organs. Really, the, the primary dangers for these two are if you somehow ingested them, then they would become a lot more dangerous, or if you inhaled them in some kind of way and they got into your bloodstream. But for the most part, that's not how we interact with these kinds of, of radioactive materials. Um, gamma is by far the scariest. All right, let's do an example of some transmutation reaction balancing. And so for this one, we're going to do polonium-218. Now, polonium-218 is capable of undergoing both alpha and beta decay. So it can actually go in either direction because of the way that its proton to neutron balance is. What we want to do is write nuclear equations that show both of these types of decay. So if you recall, we are starting with polonium-218. Polonium is element number 84 on the periodic table. And 
In one scenario, it's undergoing alpha decay. And in the other scenario, it is undergoing beta decay. Now, the way to balance each of these is we know that we've got a blank spot. There's something that's missing in each of these reaction events. The question is, what is it? And so what I want you to think about is we can almost draw a line that divides the top and the bottom and the left and the right. So on the top and bottom, I'm dealing with a mass number of 218. I need to have a mass number of 218 on this side as well. I've already got four of it. So from an algebraic standpoint, I can look at this and say, okay, 218 is equal to four plus X. And if I subtract four from each side, I get 214 for X. So 214 is my number there. In a similar fashion, I need to have 84 on both sides of the equation for atomic number. I've already got two. So 84 is equal to two plus X. If I subtract two from each side, 82 is the value of X. And 82 happens to be the atomic number for lead. So the end product here is that we would get lead 214 as our product, which is not the most stable form of lead, but it is more stable than the polonium 218 was. If this undergoes beta decay, same kind of thing. I could fraction this off. 218, 218. Well, I've got zero here. So 218 is equal to zero plus X. So X must be 218 in this case. And for polonium, I've got 84 and 84 is what I'm trying to do. 84 is equal to negative one plus X. Since I have a negative one here, I need to add one to each side. My value of X is gonna be 85. And looking on the periodic table, element 85 is AT astatine. So as you get better at this, you're going to need to let, rely less and less on the algebra. You'll just be able to kind of see it and it'll kind of click. And hopefully as you're going through doing the post lectures, um, you'll, you'll see this and it'll kind, of, it'll kind of dawn on you what you need to do next. All right, let's take a look at another example. Here I've got nuclear equations and I need to balance them and identify the type of decay. Well, actinium is element number 89. Francium is element number 87. And so if I'm looking at it from this perspective, 222 is equal to 218 plus X, so X here has to be four. 89 is equal to 87 plus X, so X must be two. So I can do one of two things. I can look at the periodic table, say, okay, periodic table, element number two is helium, or I can recognize that 
this is an alpha particle. And so the nuclear process here would be alpha decay. So just remember that little tidbit there. Helium-4 in a nuclear reaction is an alpha particle. Um, it, would, it would work the same kind of way. So if you see it as a product, helium-4 as a product, know that you're dealing with an alpha decay. Okay, this was a little bit different. We've basically flipped the structure. I've got two reactants making one product. So from the standpoint, I'm now looking at 47 plus X is equal to 47. So X must be zero. For vanadium, vanadium is element number 23. Titanium is element number 22. 23 plus X is equal to 22. So X has to be negative one. So I've got something with a mass of zero and a charge of negative one. By any other word, we would call that an electron. And so since this is happening on the reactant side, this is electron capture. If we saw this on the other side, a no mass, negative one charge um, product, that would be a beta decay, a negatron has been emitted. All right, these are ones I'm gonna want you to try yourself. So um, after you read after we go through the questions and read them together i'm going to invite you to pause the video try them on your own here and then click play again and see how you did so the two questions are these radioactive radon 222 it decays with a loss of one alpha particle write the balanced equation for the decay the second question determine the product nuclide formed by the beta decay of tritium tritium is h3 um, which we also would know as hydrogen three in this form as well. So go ahead and hit pause and we're gonna go through the answers here in three, two, one. So radon 222, radon has an atomic number of 86. So as it undergoes an alpha decay, an alpha decay would have a mass number of four, an atomic number of two. And so what would be left over? 222 minus four is 218. 86 minus two is 84. Element number 84 is polonium. If we go through the beta decay of tritium, tritium three, one hydrogen, is undergoing beta decay. Beta decay would be a beta particle emission, um, mass of zero, charge of negative one. Three minus zero is three. One minus negative one is two. And so our product nuclide, our daughter nuclide here is going to be helium three. Now there's one other thing that we need to talk about in this chapter as far as our overall concept of radioactive decays and nuclear chemistry is concerned. And that concerns the rates of radioactive decay. Now, this is more of a chem two topic, but we're gonna kind of introduce it here. And it's the idea that there's a difference between something that happens and something that happens fast. Radioactive decays are spontaneous, meaning they are going to occur on their own. But just because it occurs on its own doesn't mean that it happens fast. But the good thing is that all radioactive decays 
all occur at the same rate. They all are at the same measurable rate. And we call that rate a half-life. Now, for those of you that are taking Chem 2, um, you're going to see radioactive decays there as part of a larger discussion of chemical kinetics. Um, and half-life in chemical kinetics is going to have a slightly different meaning than it does here. Um, because different reactions are going to have different ways of measuring half-lives. But a half-life for a chemical or nuclear process is the amount of time that it takes for half of the material to react in the reaction. Which means in the case of nuclear decay, half of the radioactive particles undergo their radioactive decay. And half-life has two purposes for us. For one, we can use it to determine how long we should expect a radioactive sample to be around. And two, we can use it as a measurement of time by looking at how much time has passed versus how much time is in the half-life of a particular nucleus. And by comparing those two, um, we can get some idea of how much stuff is there and how much stuff was there beforehand, um, which has some really, really interesting kinds of consequences to it. When it comes to calculating half-lives, um, remember we are cutting them in half. Um, so if I have a whole sample after one half-life, half of that sample will be gone. If I undergo another half-life, half of that remaining sample will be gone. If I go from there, half of that remaining sample will be gone. And half of that one will be gone after the next half-life. So half-lives depend upon um, the amount present here. So um, we'll see that it's going to be really, really close to impossible to truly get rid of a radioactive sample. Um, what we're going to see instead is that the fractions get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller the more half-lives that go on. And we can predict that by basically raising one half to the power of however many half-lives have elapsed. And that would tell us how much is left from where we started. So uh, another way we can look at this is graphically. If we imagine that we have 40 radioactive um, atoms at the beginning of our process, after one half-life, 20 of them will have converted. After a second half-life, half of the remaining will have converted. So 10 of the 20 that were still there have now converted. After another half-life, we'll see that number of 10 cut in half to 5. After another half-life, we'll see that 5 turned into 2 or 3. And after another half-life, we'll see that two or three turned into one or two. And so it does progress in a very, very fundamental kind of exponential function. Probably the most common application of this is something called radiometric dating. Um, now, radiometric dating is a way that we can try to date objects based upon the amount of nuclear material that's left in them after a decay occurs. Um, and there are a number of different methods that uh, use this. Rutherford had a method of helium that he used. Um, we're probably most familiar with radiocarbon dating, um, which has been used for um, archaeological kinds of digs and artifact um, measurements. The way that we can do this is through mass spectroscopy. Mass spectroscopy allows us to measure how abundant a particular isotope is relative to other isotopes. And that can give us an idea of just how long an object has been around. As I said, radiocarbon dating is probably the most common of these because most organic materials have a considerable amount of carbon in them. You and I are carbon-based life forms. Um, our, our structural backbone is carbon-based. And so long as we breathe and we eat and we metabolize and we respirate, our body is going through a constant recycling of carbon atoms. However, 
when we die, when a organic life form dies, it is no longer exchanging carbons. And so the amount of carbon 12 to carbon 14 in the system stops. Carbon 12 is stable, so it doesn't do anything. Carbon-14, over time, because it is radioactive, will start to decay. And so what we can do is we can measure the amount of carbon-14 that is present at any given time relative to the amount of carbon-12. And based upon that ratio, we can determine, okay, how many half-lives have elapsed, and therefore how old is this object? And the age of the sample is determined using an equation like this, where the time has elapsed is equal to the half-life of the object divided by this number here, divided by the ratio of the original sample relative to this sample that it is currently. And so, that concludes our look into chapter 21 here. Now there is more material here in the um, PowerPoint. I'm gonna publish this later as a supplemental. You do not need to know this for the final exam. It is kind of applications, ways that we use nuclear chemistry to solve problems and other kinds of interesting tidbits about nuclear chemistry but it is not something that you're going to see on any exam for this course. It's just kind of interesting and useful information. I'll publish it as a supplemental. But um, thank you for watching this video, and I look forward to seeing you in class.